First Samuel chapter 1 is where we are tonight. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll dive into our Bible study. Lord, it's good to be in your house. We thank you for your word in this time that we can spend together. And we pray, God, that you would use this story to speak to us tonight. We're grateful, Lord. And our hearts are full as we've gathered here in your presence to just drink from your well that never runs dry. Thank you, Lord, for always filling us up, refreshing us, encouraging us. And we thank you, Lord, that you use your word to to do that. So speak to us tonight as we study this passage together. We love you and we give you praise and thanks together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, just by way of uh, a a little bit of a review, not much, but uh, because I don't want to take too much time to do this, but last uh, Wednesday night we had our baptisms, so two weeks ago is when we launched into the uh, first chapter of 1 Samuel, and again, in a Hebrew Bible, 1 and 2 Samuel appear as one book called the Book of Samuel, or in Hebrew, Sefer Shmuel. And the uh, book of First and Second Samuel have uh, three main characters, Samuel, Saul, and David. And this book is named after the first main character, which again is Samuel. His name in Hebrew, Shmuel, means God hears. And we are introduced to his family right here at the beginning because he's not even born yet until halfway through chapter 1. His father's name is Elkanah. Uh, And his name means God has acquired. And his mother's name is Hannah. And her name means grace in in Hebrew. What we find is that Hannah has struggled for years with the uh, challenge of infertility. She has not been able to conceive a child. And so she's heartbroken over this. She uh, pleads with God. She, She prays to God for a child. And uh, the Lord is going to answer that prayer in a very uh, marvelous and miraculous way. You have to remember that in those days, when a woman was barren, it was grounds for divorce. And so um, men would typically abandon their wives and or get a second wife uh, in order to have children through someone. And because leaving that heritage was obviously a very important thing. And so... What we find about this relationship that Elkanah has with Hannah is that he loves her dearly. He does not divorce her. He loves her and he is devoted to her, but he does take on another wife. And uh, we read about her. Her name is Penina. She also is mentioned here in chapter one. Her name means pearl. And uh, as I said last uh, or two weeks ago, what a gem she is. Um, And I say it sarcastically because she is able to have children by Elkanah, which tells us that the problem is not with him. The problem is with Hannah. And so, unfortunately, Penina rubs this in Hannah's face. She antagonizes her. She insults her. She disgraces her. In fact, it it tells us in verse 6, if you'll glance back again here at verse 6, it says, And her rival, Hannah's rival, speaking of Penina, also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb, had closed Hannah's womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she, that is Penina, provoked her. Therefore she wept, Hannah wept, and did not eat. So Very distressing situation. Again, for those of you who are new to our Bible study, you do find in the Old Testament that there was the practice of polygamy. That was not God's intention. God's design was Genesis 2, 24. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The two, not three, not four, not ten. The two, that was God's original design. So why is it then that he seems to allow what you see in the Old Testament as multiple marriages here with polygamy, like in this case? Well, you have to understand, as I mentioned last time, that sometimes when you read the Bible, it's like reading the newspaper. It is just simply recording the cultural and criminal events of the day. And this is one of those criminal things that is happening here. So don't look at what is being practiced and think that God condones it. 
What might be common in that day was not condoned by God. God's intention for marriage was one man and one woman. And so when these guys took on multiple wives, this was not consistent with God's will. This was a very fleshly thing. And so this is something that Elkanah is doing here because he's kind of caught up in the cultural norm of the day by taking uh, Penina as his second wife, by whom he has some children. And, um, but again... You can see when it speaks about Hannah and Penina that Elkanah's heart is towards Hannah because when they go for the feast times, it tells us uh, back in verse 5 that uh, to Hannah, he would give a double portion. He would give twice the amount of food to Hannah for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So there's this dynamic happening in this family where Hannah cannot, at this time, conceive children. Elkanah marries Penina. Penina then has children, so now she's rubbing it in Hannah's face, making Hannah miserable. And so Hannah has nowhere else to turn, but she cries out to God. Now, like most husbands, when a wife is distressed, Elkanah thinks he can solve his wife's problem. And uh, most husbands have to learn the hard way. Uh, Most of the times we can't solve our wives' problems. Uh, All we should really do is pray for you and be there for you. But it's kind of natural for men to want to, like, solve the problem. And this is what Elkanah does. So let's pick up the story again right there at verse uh, uh, 8. And then I'm going to read down through... Um, verse 20, and then we're going to comment on some things as it relates here to the wonderful way that Hannah deals with her adversity. But in verse 8, it says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So, you know, there, there you have it. He's like, I, you know, I see that you're crying, but after all, baby, you have me. So isn't that enough? Well, not really. Now, she doesn't, um, she's kind. She doesn't doesn't reply here. She doesn't reply. It just simply says, so Hannah arose, which is also a typical dynamic, is it not? It's like a husband and a wife, they're kind of having it out. He's trying to solve it, and she just leaves the room. And so uh, uh, that's what she does. She arose, and after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle was before the temple was built in Jerusalem. They've gone there to worship at Shiloh. It says, now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed. I want you to notice this language, bitterness of soul. Um, If any of you have struggled with infertility or you know people who have, it is a, uh, a very difficult thing to go through. It's difficult emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, in every way. It's a very difficult thing. She here is in bitterness of soul, and she prayed. I want you to circle that word pray. We'll come back to that. She sets a wonderful example for us. She prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. God can handle our emotion. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. We talked last time about how she makes a Nazarite vow. That's what's happening here. She commits this child. If she were to be blessed by having a male child, she says, God, I'm going to give him to you. I'm going to surrender him to you. And I promise even now that no razor will come upon his head. She's taking a Nazarite vow on his behalf. She's committing him, even before he's born, to the Lord and saying, He will be dedicated to you. And no razor to the hair of a man was just simply a sign that he was under the Nazarite vow. There's nothing magical about it. If you remember, Samson was under a Nazarite vow too that his mother made before he was born as well. Normally, a Nazarite vow was something that an individual voluntarily made. In the case of Samson and in the case of Samuel, both their moms make the vow on their behalf before they're even born. And she commits him to the Lord. Be careful what you promise. She says to God, if you bless me with a child, I will give him back to you. Now, we all should know in, in principle that all of our children are on loan from God anyway. They don't belong to us. 
But she, she's saying more than, you know, I'm going to dedicate him to you like we did tonight with these 10 children. She's saying, I'm going to actually give him to you in service to you. You're going to see this is a very, very challenging thing that she ends up doing here with, with, with Samuel. But she makes this commitment in verse 12. And it happened as she continued praying. There's that word again before the Lord that Eli, the priest, watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli thought she was drunk, which is kind of a curious thing. Isn't that like, you know, just because you see somebody whispering and, you know, praying under their breath, why would you naturally assume that, that she is drunk? Except that it might be a commentary on the condition of how he ran the tabernacle. Because we're going to see here that his sons were really no different. And, um, and so maybe this is more commonplace than it should have been. People kind of come and drunk to the house of the Lord. We don't really know what he sees here. But he says to her, verse 14, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. Again, more language to describe her soul. Sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. You ever been in a situation like that where you're so desperate to seek God that you're just like pouring out your soul before him? She's pouring out her soul before the Lord. Verse 16, she says, do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. So all these different words to describe her condition, bitterness of soul, sorrowful spirit. I've poured out my soul. I've given my complaint, my grief to God. And so Eli answered, I think he realizes, okay, I jumped to conclusions here. And he answered and he said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. So he just kind of gives her, her bless, his blessing and says, I, you know, I pray that God gives you whatever you're praying for. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way, notice, and ate and her face was no longer sad. Now, Something happens here, okay? She, she goes in grieved. Um, she's provoked by Penina. She um, is sorrowful of heart, and, and yet she's going to leave the house of the Lord. Now she's ready to eat because at first her whole appetite had been, you know, taken away from her because she was weeping through all this anguish. And now her face is no longer sad. Let's read a little bit longer. Verse 19. And then they rose early in the morning, she and her husband, and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. That's, of course, I'm reading New King James. That's kind of the King James way of saying that they were intimate together. And he knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And so it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, Shmuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. So the Lord heard. So that's Samuel's name there. So she names him Samuel because the Lord heard her prayer. I want to just pause there before we uh, read through the rest of, the, of this chapter and maybe, maybe into chapter two, depending on how much time we have. And, and I want to just point out a few things that I think are important for us to learn from her example, because Hannah is a wonderful example of, uh, of someone who endured adversity and came out on the other side uh, to be a good example for us. She, she models for us not, not only uh, what to do in response to the painful matter of infertility, but she models for us how to manage life's deep disappointments. And so I just want to point out a a few things here uh, from her example, and then we'll get back to our story. But I'm pulling this from chapter one, and there are four things uh, that she models for us. Prayer, perseverance, praise, and patience. And so I just want to look at each of these four things very briefly. The first is prayer. Hannah was a praying woman. You will notice with me in chapter 1, verse 10, verse 12, verse 13, verse 16, verse 26, and verse 27. All those verses speak about Hannah praying. She was a praying woman. 
She was committed to pray, not just because she wanted a child, although she did. That was obviously part of it. But she prayed because she knew that it was the only remedy to a hurting heart. She knew. She describes herself in verse 10 as a woman with bitterness of soul. She describes herself in verse 11 as a woman of affliction. She describes herself in verse 15 as a woman uh, with, who is sorrowful in spirit. Verse 16, a woman in grief. Okay, so this is how she describes herself. This is real. This is how she feels. This is her life experience. And the only one that can heal all that is God. This is what she knows. Her, her husband can't, can't heal the deepest issues of her heart. Her friends can't heal the deepest issues of her heart. No, no counselor can heal the deepest issues of her heart. The priest, Eli, can't heal the deepest issues of her heart. The only one who can is the Lord. And sometimes we go to all kinds of lengths to try to get healing for our heart, and we forget that the one who can really minister healing is the Lord himself. And we need to be praying people, because Hannah understood that the one who's going to really soothe my hurting heart, like no one else can, is the Lord. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with sharing with other people and getting them to pray with you and, um, and getting their, you know, their encouragement and maybe they'll have a verse every now and again to kind of lift your spirit. And so that's fine. The Bible talks about this in Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. First Thessalonians five eleven says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you were doing. But the point is that all the encouragement, comfort, and counsel of another human being cannot be a substitute for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that happens in your heart through prayer. And she is a praying woman. She understands the friend that she has in the Lord. This is the hymn of our faith, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what a peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So Hannah understood this. The deep need of my heart and the ache of my soul, I need to give to God and I need to seek his face. And that's what she does. She's a praying woman. So prayer is important. When we're going through some kind of adversity or some kind of difficulty, she models this for us. The other thing she models for us is perseverance. And by that, I mean that she continued to seek the Lord despite what other people were saying around her. You know, when you look at the different people who were speaking into her life, they weren't encouraging. You know, first her husband, we pointed out there, Elkanah questions, why are you crying? And, you know, aren't I better than 10 sons? And so she has to hear that. And that doesn't help. And then, and then, of course, Penina provokes her. We already read that in verse 6. Uh, that irritates her. That hurts her. She's weeping. Uh, Penina is one of the first trash talkers of the Bible. And so, you know, there she is, just heaping all this insult on Hannah. And so Hannah's dealing with that. And then she goes to church, and the pastor misjudges her. The priest here, Eli, looks at her and says, you're drunk, woman. You've been drinking too much. She goes, I promise I haven't been hitting the sauce. And he goes, yeah, you have. She goes, no, I haven't. You know, I'm just praying to God. I'm pouring out my soul unto the Lord. And so think about what she had to put up with. The people around her weren't very encouraging. You know, Elkanah tries, but, you know, he, he, he doesn't. And Penina intentionally hurts her, and Eli is misjudging her. And she's, she's hearing all this, and yet she perseveres through it. She doesn't let what other people say, some with good intentions, some with bad intentions, dissuade her from just trusting God in the moment. She pours out her heart to the Lord, and she continues to just... Trust the Lord and persevere. And then the other thing that she models for us here is praise. I love in verse 19, if you look again at verse 19, where it says, uh, And then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and then returned and came to their house at Ramah. There she is worshipping the Lord before God has answered her prayer. 
Do you ever find that hard to do? It's easy to worship the Lord when he answers your prayer just how you want him to. But how about when he doesn't seem to answer your prayer? How about when, when the heavens seem like brass? You're not getting an answer. And God seems to be silent. How easy is it to worship? And yet she does. She worships while she waits. Man, do we need to learn this. She worships while she waits. She doesn't worship when she gets, I mean, she worships when she gets the answer. But she worships even before that. Why? Because she's just praising God for his worth. That's what worship is. It's worship. God is worthy of our praise for who he is. And so she's worshiping him for who he is. And she's able to separate her desire, her request from the character and nature of God. Because even if God does not answer my prayer the way I want, it does not change his character and his nature. He is just and holy and true and loving in all his ways. He is perfect and he is worthy of our praise. She doesn't wait until he gives the answer. She worships him even before he answers. She sets a good example for us. And then the last thing I think is important also to point out is her patience. Because verse 20 says... So it came to pass in the process of time. I think NIV says in the course of time. It came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son. But she had to wait. In the process of time, it doesn't say immediately, it doesn't say the next month, it doesn't even say soon thereafter, it says in the process of time. David would say in Psalm twenty-seven, fourteen, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits and, and in his word I put my hope. So there are many things that we would like now. And yet we have to learn the discipline of waiting upon the Lord for his perfect timing. We talked about this a little bit on Sunday. God is never late. God is always on time. And so we need to trust him that in the course of time, he's going to accomplish his good purposes. You know, for some of you who maybe you struggle with infertility, perhaps your child is already born. And maybe God wants that child to be adopted into a loving Christian home. You know, we we just don't know how God might answer prayer in the course of time. But we have to be patient, knowing that he always has our best interest in mind. And so these things she models for us, prayer, perseverance, praise, patience. Let's go back to our story now. So in the process of time, she conceives, she has a son, she names him Samuel. He's going to grow up here to become a prophet. He's also going to be a judge of Israel. He's going to be this transitionary figure between the period of the judges into the period of the kings. But for now, he's just a little baby. Verse 21, now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. Now remember, she, she made a vow to God. And so Elkanah goes every year for the feast to the tabernacle there in Shiloh. And for a while, Hannah's like, not quite ready to turn him over. And for good reason, you know, perhaps she wants to delay the inevitable. Who, who would blame her, um, turning over her child? Um, but on the other hand, she wants to wait till he's been weaned. And so she says, well, not yet. I'm not going to go just yet until the child is weaned. And, and, and then I'll appear before the Lord and he'll remain there forever. And so it says that Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. In other words, be be true to your word. Be true to your vow. And then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And it says, and now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. 
So then the question becomes, how old is Samuel here based on, you know, when would he have been weaned? And so we don't really know. You read different things. Bible scholars say around age two, he would have been weaned. Some say three, some say five. I read one commentary that said 12. I was like, 12? 12? Shouldn't he go on to the bottle way before that? But actually the word in the Hebrew for weaned means no longer dependent on his mother. And so that's why some scholars say it doesn't necessarily literally mean nursing. It can just mean that he's old enough that he's no longer dependent on his mother. So that's why some say 12. But most Bible scholars believe that he was probably much younger and that he was somewhere between three to five years of age. Now, I want you to try to imagine this. You are a mom and a dad for that matter. But I mean, the heart of a mother, especially for a child that she has prayed for for years, is about ready to take her little boy to the house of the Lord and turn him over to Eli the priest and let him grow up there in the tabernacle. This is no easy thing. Don't read your Bibles and just think, oh, well, you know, that was just simple for her to do. No, this is a real life person with real life feelings and a real life family here and a real life son that she's been praying for. And now she's going to fulfill a vow that she made to the Lord here. So this is this is just painful to even, you know, I mean, some of you, uh, you know, had this week your, your, your child maybe first day of school and you're like, you know, weeping that your child went to school, but your child's coming home. But think about if you had to actually take your child to school and never come home. I mean, that's a whole different, that different set of emotions here. This is what she's going to be dealing with here. And so it, it, it says that when, verse 24, now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. So she's going to bring an offering here, with with, uh, make a sacrifice with the bulls and the the flour and the skin of wine. And it says, and the child was young. Okay, that's how we know probably wasn't 12. He's got to be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five. And then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And he said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am. And she said, rather, this is Hannah speaking. Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord for this child. I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And so they worshiped the Lord there. There you have it again. They're worshiping him on the front end and the back end. They're not waiting for God to answer this prayer. They're going to worship God right up front because he's worthy of our praise just because of who he is. But now they're also worshiping him. This is a very difficult thing. I want you to imagine this. And by the way, the language here, when it says there in verse 28, therefore, I've also lent him to the Lord Uh, And he shall be lent to the Lord. It can be translated, I surrender him to the Lord. You know, I'm I'm fulfilling my vow. It's not like he's on loan in the sense like, you know, we loan somebody a coat. This is he's he's she's actually surrendering her son to the tabernacle of God under the care of Eli, the priest and very challenging here. And, And she's worshiping. She's she's she's. Praising God for who he is. Lord, you, I've, I've asked for a child. You gave me a male child. And now that he's weaned, I'm giving him to you. I'm taking him to the tabernacle of the Lord. And chapter 2 is this prayer slash praise of Hannah's. Uh, much, much of it. So let's read into chapter 2. She, she prays. She's praising the Lord. And she says in verse 1, it says, And Hannah prayed. There she is praying again. And said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. But notice that sometimes we, we're, we don't necessarily rejoice in, in the moment because this is excruciatingly painful for her to have to part with her son. But we rejoice in the Lord. We rejoice in the Lord. Not always in the circumstance, but we're praising him for who he is. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted to the Lord. A horn was a sign of strength, like an ox or a steer. Their horn was a sign of strength. So she's saying, my strength is in the Lord. I exalt him. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. This is a little vindication here for Hannah. You know, I, I don't think she's rubbing it in Penina's face the way the Penina rubbed it in her face, but I, maybe she's winking at least in her direction. Like, you know, like I smile at my enemies, Penina. I smile at my enemies 
because I rejoice in your salvation, Lord. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Notice, she's just focusing on the character and nature of the Lord. You're unique in all your ways. You're holy. There's none like you. There's no, there isn't any rock like our God. And then verse 3, talk no more so very proudly. A warning to the proud and the arrogant. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken. The bows, rather, of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. In other words, she's describing honor to the Lord. She's saying, you're sovereign in all, the, in all your ways, Lord. You, you, you make, you make the, the, the poor rich. You make the rich poor. You, you, you make the weak strong. You make the strong weak. Like everything is in your hands. I praise you for who you are. He says for, she says, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And he will give strength to his king. This is a very interesting verse here, verse 10, the last part of verse 10. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn, or again, the strength of his anointed. Now, this is before any king. Saul has not yet been selected as the first king of Israel. So this is a prophetic statement she's making here. And this is actually the first time in the Bible that there is a reference to the Messiah. Because the actual word for Messiah in Hebrew, Mashiach, means anointed one. We, we translate it as Christ, Christ the anointed one. She says, he, God, will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed, of his Mashiach. And so this is actually one of the very first prophetic statements about the Messiah. And in fact... Read the next verse, verse 11. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child, that's Samuel, ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. And um, this is a statement that young Eli is now going to be, or rather young Samuel is going to be ministering in the house of the Lord where Eli is. But uh, this wonderful prophetic little statement that, uh, that Hannah makes here about the coming king, the Messiah, prophetically, she speaks about him in advance of his coming because she sees the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords, and she gives praise to God, the one who brings about his anointed one. So. I'm going to stop there for tonight because I want to share communion together. And then we're, it, it, it switches gears here to the wicked sons of Eli. So uh, this guy's got some really sinful sons. You know, the, these pastor's kids, you've got to look out for them. They're just <laughs> kind of some wild guys. Uh, but uh, we'll get into that next time. But for the moment, let's just park it here because she gives this wonderful praise to the Lord. She gives this wonderful tribute to God, worships him for who he is, thanking him for his sovereignty, and even prophesying about the coming anointed one, Jesus, our Messiah. So let's prepare for communion as the ushers come, worship team comes again. Let's just bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord. Father, we do worship you. We thank you for Hannah's example the praise that she gave to you because you are worthy of our praise. Before you answer our prayers, after you answer our prayers, if our prayers never get answered the way we hope, you are still worthy of our praise. We thank you, Lord, that you 
sent your anointed one, the King Jesus, to die on a cross for our sins. And tonight as we prepare to receive communion together, we're just thankful that Jesus came to die on a cross for our sins. That you surveyed the landscape of humanity and you saw that there was none righteous. And so you tell us in your word that your own arm worked salvation. You came among us. And you breathed our air and you felt our pain and you took on our sins. And you died on a cross, Lord. And so we're grateful and we're thankful. And we remember your sacrifice tonight. In Jesus' name.